and I thought, I know, it's like, I'm in Hollywood, I can do whatever I want. So I found these carpenters and knocked up some sort of weird this like but um because it was very different on Sherlock I didn't really have to redecorate much because it sort of fit into the Victorian Captain Nemo we have this up You know the uh, you know the back wall really is you know it's Bob Moog's first synthesizer and you said stuff I mean it comes in really hard and and, and built just at you and in a in, in surprising way and it's not digital and not well behaved and we like a little bit of edge here I've, or there. I've heard that from many other people. Can we actually go to one of the walls or just... Sure, absolutely. Come on. Well, right now it's, you know, right now you, you caught me in that period in between movies where, you know, I mean, yes, we're, we're actually, you know, fairly silent. Um, <laughs> you know, but, you know, but if... if you know, maybe just one or two things start going, but I'm not, it's not going to make any fabulous noises right now. Yeah, now admit, what you're doing right now actually doesn't do anything but make it look really cool. It just makes it look really cool. That's exactly what I'm doing right now, because you've got a camera and, you know. But, um, you know, this, this, I grew up with technology. You know, all musical instruments are technology, really. I, uh, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, a bit of wood that somebody carved into a violin and killed a cat to stick strings on. It's, it's all technology. It's just, I happen to be born around a time when this sort of stuff came in and, and, and I, you know, I wasn't very good at my piano lessons, put it that way, but I was very good at computers and I, that came out, you know, and I started making music with computers and with synthesizers. And I really started out as a synth programmer for other composers. I worked for Michael Kamen and Stanley Myers and people like that. So what exactly, so the things that are on the wall right now for people who are... Co okay, all right. Um, <laughs> okay, these things are oscillators, which you plug into filters, which, uh, you know, um, it, it really what it does is a synthesizer, it can synthesize out of the components that a sound, that, that a sound is made out of. So you can, you know, the, the, they used to tell you in the 70s and the 80s that, you know, anything that's in your head you could synthesize. Well, it's not quite like that. You know, there, there are limitations. And at the end of the day, you know, you go to the piano, which is 600 years of technology, you know, refined technology, and you play one note and it sounds fabulous, you know, and it's, it's a, lot, a lot less of a struggle. But, you know, the... I hear the world probably more than I see it, you know, and, and, you know, for instance, on Sherlock, I mean, I was very much thinking about, you know, the, the, you know, it was, it was a time before computers, it was a, the industrial age, there was a lot of huffing and puffing going on and steam and stuff like that. I like creating these sort of sonic landscapes and, and this stuff helps me, plus this stuff sort of helps me to think differently, you know, it's, it's, there's something, you know, very physical about moving you know, jack plugs around as opposed to sitting there with your mouse in front of a keyboard. No, definitely. You know. Can we look at what's on this wall over here? Okay, um, this is sort of, it's sort of all more of the same, you know, and it's, 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 plus, you know, the old thing, does that die with the most toys win? Um, <laughs> the, you know, and, and, and I bought a lot of this, you know, people, uh, th there was a time, you know, when, when everybody got into digital synthesis and, you know, and, and, and people were just chucking the stuff away. Actually, this wall, um, Here, uh, yeah, at one point, I mean, it, this is this is one of the great synthesizers, the Roland synthesizer. And I, through one way or the other, I found out that Roland had a warehouse full of this stuff, which they couldn't sell. And I phoned them up and I said, how much do you want for it? And they go, well, if you take everything, we'll sell it to you by the pound. Actually, it was the kilo, but you know, for twenty-five bucks a kilo, um, which is ridiculous because now, of course, y you know, you know how time catches up with things, and um, you know, now now it's unaffordable. So, you, what year did you buy all this? This this was probably um, early eighties. Yeah, it was it was just that transition period. You know, where everybody went, no, 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 it's got to be modern, it's got to be digital, that's the future, and let's just junk all the old stuff. Have you, can you, for yourself, obviously I might not be able to tell 
but can you hear the difference between all these different pieces of instrumentation? Yes, I can. Here? Yeah, I can. I mean, I absolutely can. You know, I'm I'm a nerd. You know, I mean, uh, you know, you can put on a record and I can go, oh, oh, yeah, EMS VCS3. Oh, yes. Okay, ARP 2600. Um, oh, Moke ladder filter. You know, I don't know. Uh, Yes. Okay. I mean, it's it's a it's a terrible thing to admit to. You know, like it just points to a waste of childhood. But you know. Yeah, but you're uh, also, but you're very good at your job, and I think that everyone who's exceptionally talented at their job knows what they're doing. Yeah. I, that, well, know. yeah. You know, and, and and really honestly, I love this stuff. You know, I, you know, knobs and buttons and stuff like this. It's all, it's all really good. You know, and, um, you know. Look, I, I started my career out. I mean, the, the the people who really gave me my George Martin was one of the first person the people to give me a job, you know. And the man had produced the Beatles, you know. It, it was amazing hanging out with those guys and being able to ask them questions, you know. How did you mic the drums, or etc. etc. And I come from a technological family, so th there was never any great difference between music and technology, and. I, th I think the reason I went into music was because I didn't have to be in competition with my dad, who was a scientist, you know, but it could have gone the other way. And so I feel very at home with, with, with this sort of stuff. Well, what's also interesting is if we go over to the computers, uh, yeah. the, uh, don't, uh, don't fall, right, don't, right. Don't, don't worry. It's not, a, you know, and, and you know, at, at the same time, I mean, you've got like, you know, I, I, Austrian art up on the walls and you've got a lot of books and, you can never go wrong with Vienna, one of the best no, cities on the No, absolutely, planet. absolutely. You know, and, and uh, uh, you know, and I ask myself, you know, why, why, why such a small city with such a, you know, diverse population um, could come up with, with with so much art and culture, yeah, it, it, and, and 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 modern thought, you know, modern philosophy. How come, you know, um, this is so off the topic, you know, but. Outside Vienna, in a, in a small Austrian town, I mean, a village. Uh, in the village school, at one point, Wittgenstein, Ludwig Wittgenstein, you know, our great philosopher, m must have been playing on the schoolyard with Adolf Hitler. You know, what's the possibility that two, you know, two, you know, the inf you know, people who have influenced our world in such a dramatic way would be playing in the schoolyard in some little village. You know, what's what's the what's the chances of that? Well, Vienna also has a long uh, uh, history, Austria has a yeah. long history with music, with absolutely, with culture. absolutely. It's, it's a very there's obviously something in the water there. Right. Well, yeah. It's, uh, well, it's something in the water, and they didn't really go and make anything else. It's like, look, it's like Hollywood. We don't really make anything here other than we're good at making movies and um, we're probably very good at having too many lawyers as well. But, um, you know, other than that, it's sort of a useless town. And I don't mean that in a totally derogatory way, only in a slightly derogatory way. Well, but it, but and, and the sun shines. Yeah, the weather here is amazing. Yeah, Let's you know, not knock yeah absolutely. You know, not, um, so when, when, we, when I look around, I see all these keyboards and I see a Mac and I see this, you know, the monitor oh, yeah. and this Hewlett Packer, I believe. Yeah. So. Yeah, and everything makes a horrible noise or <laughs> noise of one way or the other. Um, this guy's obviously not doing anything. How did you decide on the equipment? Oh, well, wait. Just to scare the children. <laughs> um, How did you decide? Obviously, I'm sure you have your pick of which technology you want to use. How did you decide on the stuff that we're looking at right now? Um, a lot of it, we build our, a lot of our technology here because the problem is the imagination is always a little ahead of the people who actually go and make things and sell it commercially. Um, you know, like these touch screens, etc. are really, you know, I, you know, I was just thinking after a while, why am I doing everything with a mouse? I mean, you know, do things with a touch screen. I mean, I got all these fingers to do things with, and it's a very easy way of reconfiguring something. Is this the actual place where you compose stuff? Is this the the seat that you use, or is this, this is the no? This is it. This is it. This is pretty much it. But I mean, to be really honest, most of the most of the writing happens in my head, you know. And um, I try not to. I try not to really touch this thing, the keyboard, until I know what I want to roughly what I want to write about, because otherwise 
look, everybody has access to the, the same 12 notes here, you know, and you're just flailing about all day, you know, and anything, you know, yes, everything becomes a sort of a pretty tune, but it doesn't have a point of view, you know, so you have to go and, you know, you have to figure out what you want to write about, and, and then the notes sort of, after a long, big neurotic struggle, so suddenly start falling into place. So what happens? Do you, do you look at the footage on, say, one of these monitors as you're composing? How does it exactly work? Um, and how did it work for Sherlock Holmes? Actually, Sherlock Holmes was, was different in so far. That is exactly how you describe it. Usually the way it works with me is it starts off with a conversation with the director. And it usually starts off before he goes out and shoots a movie. You know, we, we, we're, start, we're, we're at least starting to figure out our language. We're at least trying to figure out our sort of sonic world or what we're trying to write about. Sherlock Holmes was different because I just got a phone call one day from Guy Ritchie going, hey, I'm doing the Sherlock Holmes movie, and every time I go into the cutting room, they keep putting more and more Dark Knight music all over it, and I don't like it, which was, a, for me, a perfect way of starting a conversation because the last thing I wanted to do was um, do, you know, Dark Knight Part 2 in Victorian England. So, um, plus, you know, look, Sherlock's a comedy, you know, whichever way you look at it, and Dark Knight is definitely, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't worried about protecting many jokes in that one. Um, so I went over and I looked at it, and I, I looked at it very, you know, uh, with a sort of slight European dubiousness, and the whole thing I had grown up with the Sherlock Holmes stories, and I loved the Sherlock Holmes stories, and I had heard rumors of guy who had never met wanting to do this sort of action-y version of Sherlock. And, and, and the thing, of course, which attracted me to Sherlock Holmes was, you know, that intelligence as adventure, you know, what the synapse is firing in the guy's brain is as exciting as a car chase. I mean, that's what, you know, so, but within 20 minutes, guy had me because he had that, that you know, that device he uses where, where you hear Sherlock Holmes describing what he's going to do next, you know, the slow-mo pre-visualizations. I thought, wow, he's actually solved how to do that. And, you know, and, 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 and then, you know, I, I knew I wanted to do quirky, and I, I knew, you know, and so much of this stuff, you know, you're asking, am I looking at the picture on the monitor? Yes, I am, from a certain point on. But most of it is, you know, it's like remembering key images and writing from there and, and trying to come up with the sound and trying to come up with the tune. Well, one of the things I really like about the film, uh, especially, and it's very memorable, is how that, that, that score at the beginning. It's a very overpowering. It's very, I mean, you know you've entered a different world. Abs well, yeah. You know, and, and, and uh, you know, we fought for that. You know, I mean, the, 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 you know, look, I'm... Uh, I don't know if I want to be controversial or whatever. I, I certainly don't mind being polarizing. I, I think you've got to be hot or cold. You can't be lukewarm. You know, and um, it is a quirky score, and it is a powerful score, and it doesn't hide. You know, it doesn't do... You know, people people always think, you know, oh, good film music is music that sort of homogeneously floats around in the background and supports the scenes in a sort of a gentle way. That's not what I was trying to do on Sherlock Holmes. You know, it, it was very outspoken. It was very much with a point of view. You know, I was pretty bold okay. and, and, and very different, very, very different. You know, and at the same time, you know, and this is more for an audience to say, I think it was the right thing to do on that movie. I think it 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 gave it a it gave it a color that you wouldn't have gotten had I just gone down the you know had I trudged down the path of doing, you know, a Victorian or you know Elgar or any of the great classical English music and you know gone down that sort of road. No, totally. And uh, and to be really honest with you, while Avatar is getting a lot of press right now for the visuals. No disrespect to the music on that, I don't remember it. It doesn't stand out. And in respect to your score, it is very, very much, a, it adds that third dimension to the film. Well, you have to have a director who has that sort of courage, you know, and who wants to go there and goes, okay, we're going to go bold. We're going to go and be provocative. Um, and, and, completely, and completely gets that, you know, once you start going down that path, you can't go and turn back. 
either because it's it's you know the, the whole idea of Sherlock was you know I, I wanted to I wanted to bring in these great soloists and really let them be virtuosic and let them let you hear their let them be as expressive as possible so you can't turn human expression down you either take it out or you play it boldly and we settled for playing it boldly and and and, and you know there looked there, there were a couple of arguments with um, people who shall remain nameless and people who got a little worried and th there was a point um, which was super duper terrifying for both Guy and me where we had to go and preview the music for the score because it was so different you know and and you know look this was Warner Brothers Christmas movie totally. right and here's a guy I don't know how much the movie costs, but a movie costs a hundred million dollars. If you're, you know, if, if anything costs anything anymore these days, you know, who was putting banjos and out of tune pianos into this hundred million dollar Christmas spectacular, and um, yeah, we, you know, there, there we were in Arizona, you know, and playing it, and then the focus group, you know, and them asking, well, did you like the music? And that moment between that, uh, you know, and the question being asked you know, was was the longest time I spent in hell. Well, that probably was only a second, but it felt like eight years of purgatory. Which is, it's very interesting that you say this because your resume is very impressive and you've been doing this for a very long time, yet it sounds to me like you're just as nervous as you were, you know. It's, it's, it's yes. I mean, every movie starts the same way. I have no idea what to do and I have no idea how to do it. Plus, I don't know where the music comes from. You know, I don't know the mechanics of why somebody can think of a tune and why somebody can't. So what if they turn off the tap, right? <laughs> you know, so, so, so I, you know, so every, every you know, and, and the job is slightly different because you're supposed to go and do something. You, you're supposed to invent. That's really what they're asking you to do. And not only invent any old thing, it's supposed to be appropriate for whatever we're working on and it's supposed to be something that nobody else can imagine I mean if I asked an audience you know what's the music you want to hear in Sherlock Holmes I mean they'll, they'll very quickly tell me what it would be right but that's not my job my job is to do the unimaginable you know? I definitely know and I'll, I'll definitely say it that uh, Mr. Nolan wants nothing revealed about Inception yes I don't want to know anything story related but I am curious the teaser trailer had this amazing sound in it like this this I don't know if it was your music or whose music was it but I'm curious if that is the kind of tone with the music that you're could you talk about that kind of effect? well um, the sounds actually written in Chris's script I mean it, you know quite honestly I mean that's that's Chris's Chris's writing and it's very much his direction and the trailer is is half um, half the trailer house and I, I don't actually know who the composer was and then we took it over and we started adding things to it as well um, especially because I believe the trailer house or the composer never got to read the script <laughs> so he doesn't quite know what he's supposed to be doing and what it's all about and and we're not going to tell you oh, and I don't want to know. no no I know yeah. because the great thing is and we did that with Dark Knight you know we worked in such privacy and everybody knew we, you know, everybody knew it was going to be Batman and it was going to be um, the Joker, but they didn't know what Batman and what Joker. And I think there's something great about, especially in this day and age, where everybody knows everything instantly over the internet. You know, isn't it nice when we can still surprise you? Well, that's, that's and the, scare you a little. That, that is actually what I'm most excited about. Is I, I, for me personally, I'm trying to find out nothing. I right. want to walk into that theater and know nothing. Right. I know it's not going to happen because I have to sell the movie in trailers and whatever else. But we got to be cautious. Yes, but saying that, I am curious. the The score in that teaser is very. It's it's the sound is amazing. Well, uh, and yeah. I'm, I'm curious about the about your writing process for. Well, that. well, I have to say I didn't. I, I had very little to do with the trailer other than going. Oh, you know those big bongs. Actually, you know, I mean those type of big bongs um, right. but, you know curiously enough you know I might be just starting to work on it um, you know I knew what they were about but my, my friend partner um, music producer Lon Balf really really got to grips with the trailer and Chris 
Chris is very collegial, and Chris and Long get on really well as well. So it's you know it's it's like it is a team, and especially since so much of that came from the script. And Long hadn't read the script, you know. And I'm so sort of going, no, 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 just trust it, you know. Let's just, you know, totally. Right, um, you know, I need big boings here, <laughs> right? I'm very curious though, how long for say Sherlock Holmes, going back to that, uh, going back to Sherlock for a second, how long does it typically take you to write a score? And for, for Sherlock, how long did it take? Seven months. Um, I was supposed to have two months or three months or something like that, and then I looked at the release date and it was Christmas. I'm going, what are you? Why, why am I supposed to be finished first of August, guys? You know, um, it takes as long as they give me. You know, I have done movies in crazy record time, but I, I like the. You know, it could get better if you give me, you know, the, the, look, the difference is, you know, and it really is true, you know, I mean, it's all a, the inspiration, the moment of inspiration is, you know, a split second, you can't even measure it. But there's this other thing about just rolling up your sleeves and doing the work and, and spending the time with something and refining it. Um, and, and, and you get better ideas and you get better, you know. Time, time is an important thing, and and being able to say, you know, to, to to stretch the moment out for as long as possible before you say, oh, it's finished, because somehow the hubris in my brain goes, if I don't say it's finished, I still leave the door open for a good idea to happen, and you know, as soon as I say it's finished, and I listen back to it, it's just oh, it's just Hans, you know, it's just me again, you know, but. You know, I, I, I preclude the possibility that greatness could strike <laughs> by saying it's finished. And so, you know, at the end of the day, it's the studio that goes, okay, guys, we got a release date. You know, let's get a move on here. Totally. I know I have to wrap with you, but I do want to ask, uh, obviously, you're getting ready to start on Inception. Have you started or you're starting now? I've started. I've started. I did, you know, I saw Chris at the Sherlock Holmes premiere in London. I was more tired than I'd been, I think, ever in my life. I mean, I, I had worked for seven months without a single day off. Lots of other complications had happened during that time. You know, I can't, there was a whole period where I'd get home at about sort of seven or eight in the morning. I was burned. I was tired. I, I was going to take a serious holiday. I see Chris at the premiere, and as I see him, I'm getting an idea, and we were in the studio two days after the premiere trying out the idea. So I'm, I'm my own worst enemy, and which is a long way of answering, yes, I'm working on it. <laughs> right, well, I'm, I'm, what, I was, what I was going with this is, uh, what are you planning on doing after Inception? Have you lined up other gigs? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I got a movie with my best friend Jim Brooks, um, Untitled Jim Brooks Project, as it's called on IMDb. Um, uh, so, yes, something very different. And I'm doing another thing with uh, Gore Verbinski called Rango, oh, yeah. uh, which is really interesting. Really, And I saw Gore last night, and, you know. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not entirely out of work. Oh, I'm just out of sleep. No, I understand. Well, my, I guess I do want to ask you, uh, you've done some uh, work on the Pirates franchise, just just a touch. Just a one or two, yeah, yeah right, okay. Just, just a touch. Uh, so I was curious, are you thinking about, are they going to have you back for the fourth one? Go and I were talking about that. Yeah, you know, the way you're asking the question is, is absolutely right. Yes, of course I'm thinking about it. But I, at the same time, I'd love to see a script. <laughs> right, well, I, I think they're still not, they still have a very far away release date. They have a far away, I, don't, I think the release date just, just changed yesterday. I don't think, I don't, I don't know for sure, but I heard a rumor that it might have gotten itself nailed down. I think, wasn't it May of 011 or July of 011? That's not that far away. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. It's interesting, actually, it's a very good call because they might be suffering, this is of course totally off subject, but they might be suffering from the Spider-Man 4 thing where they are just like... Funny you should say that. No, 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 I just think, you know, Spider-Man 4 isn't coming out when it's supposed to be coming out now, is it? No, they, well, that movie has been uh, nuked. Exactly. Sure so. so does that mean that a date has opened up. Well, two movies have already moved to that date. The Thor and right. I think Pirates moved too. Uh-huh. Yeah, but that, right. that's been on, yeah, that was a, that was online I think yeah. a few days ago. Right. Okay, but yeah. you you see what I'm saying, you know, so it's not that far away. Right. Uh, no, I'd love to see a script. <laughs> I understand. Um, I have to wrap with you. I could talk to you for a very long time about a lot of movies, but I will say uh, thank you so much for thank giving you. your time and let me do one last pan of the uh, 
of the room in the decor so people can enjoy it. It's not so bad. It's you know, I mean, there are worse places to be changed to a chair. So this is quite. I walked into this room and was completely uh, blown away. 